Sadly, we must report the world is a far, far more dangerous place than when we last saw you yesterday. Without question, Cold War 2.0 has started, and at least so far, the Russians are setting the rules. Here's how President Biden described the man in charge, Vladimir Putin. Putin is the aggressor. Putin chose this war, and now he and his country will bear the consequences. We're going to get to the day's developments in a minute, but history, sadly, is repeating itself. Let's compare Hitler in 1938 to Vladimir Putin in 2022. The similarities are very similar. Justification for war. Hitler, World War I, the Treaty of Versailles. Hitler wanted to avenge what had been done to Germany by the, Hitler, by the Treaty of Versailles. Putin views the breakup of the Soviet Union much like Hitler did the Treaty of Versailles. He considers it a national embarrassment. He will avenge the breakup of the Soviet Union in the Cold War. They use similar language. Hitler talked about the great fatherland, uniting the greater ethnic Germany of the fatherland. Putin, uniting the greater ethnic Russian of the Russian motherland. Invasion of a foreign country to protect the native language speakers. When Hitler invaded Czechoslovakia, he talked about protecting the Germans who were living in Czechoslovakia, the ethnic Germans. Very similar, Putin's invasion of Crimea in, 19, in 2014, that's a typo right there, that was to protect the ethnic Russians in Crimea. We saw him use the very same language in his speech a couple of days ago when they annexed those parts of Ukraine in the eastern portion, saying that they wanted to protect the ethnic Russians there. Hitler teamed up with Japan to create the axis of powers, and obviously it was Japan that ended up attacking the United States. Putin is teaming up with Xi Jinping. And the talking points of the American isolationists are about the same in the 1940s as 2022, summed up by the American first spokesman, Charles Lindbergh. This is what Lindbergh said, quote, the doctrine that we must enter the wars of Europe in order to defend America will be fatal if our nation, if we follow it. We must turn our eyes and our faith back to our own country before it's too late. Oddly enough, we are hearing some of the very same things from both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, today. America should not get involved in a war in Europe. There is one big difference right now between Vladimir Putin and Adolf Hitler. Vladimir Putin has nuclear weapons, lots of them, 6,200 in fact. And yesterday, he threatened to use them on anybody who dared intervene in his bombing and invasion of Ukraine. Live pictures right now in Kyiv. Parts of the city has power, as you can see, and big parts of it does not. It's unclear if that's because of a blackout to prevent Russian airstrikes or because of a power plant bombing. We simply don't know. The Ukrainian military says despite thousands of Russian rockets, cruise missiles, bombs, and artillery throughout their country, they are mounting a brave defense, saying they shot down this helicopter. But Russian forces captured the Chernobyl nuclear power plant on their way towards the capital and are demanding, the Russians are demanding, the Western-friendly government in Kyiv surrender. So far, they have been able to hold out. President Biden today stopped short of sanctioning Vladimir Putin himself or delisting the Russian banks from the U.S.-controlled international wire transfer system known as SWIFT. Why he choose, chose to do that is curious. But in a strongly worded speech, Mr. Biden attacked Putin, reiterated American troops would not fight to protect Ukraine, and issued sanctions on a few Russian banks and Russian oligarch families as he restricted the export of U.S. technology to Russia. Curiously and notably, he admitted what many have said all along. The threat of sanctions would never have deterred Vladimir Putin. No one expected the sanctions to prevent anything from happening. It has to show this is going to take time. Let's take a look very quickly at the current battle map. This is D-Day plus one. We're about 20 hours, 22 hours into the war. Right now, it is a little past 2 a.m. in Ukraine. If we're going to put the map into this, one more click. We'll see if the map comes up. We don't have the map, but we'll put it on the full screen for you to see there. Airstrikes all throughout all of Ukraine. Command and control depots have been taken out. Airports have been taken out as well. We understand the Russians have air superiority. There are no U.S. aircraft flying over Ukraine. So the Ukrainians 
do not get the help of U.S. intelligence. There were three invasion routes, one in the north coming down, straight down towards the capital, one coming through Donetsk in the east, where the Russians have a huge amount of forces. It's a flanking attack over to Kharkiv, which is the city uh, in the north there of the eastern part of Ukraine, and from the south, quite literally, land, sea, and air invasion of Ukraine. With that, we want to bring in Congressman Mark Green, House Foreign Affairs, former Army Ranger, Special Operations Flight Surgeon. Congressman, good to see you. Uh, you listened to POTUS's speech, the President's speech. Do we have any choice now, or have we resigned ourselves to sort of sitting back and watching whatever Vladimir Putin does? Yeah, it would look like the President has given up on deterring Vladimir Putin. I mean, he, this piecemeal approach, I, I loved your comparison of, um, you know, Putin to Hitler especially as it relates to Czechoslovakia, the, the way he went in there. That's a great, great comparison. But I would compare, you know, Joe Biden to Neville Chamberlain. And this piecemeal approach, thinking that it's somehow going to stop the, the dictator, is just foolish. Uh, and so uh, to answer your question, it would appear so, Leland, sadly. That's pretty scary. There, there is one difference, I guess, between President Biden and the typical isolationist if you will, that we're hearing. He did say pretty strongly, we'll see if we have that soundbite, uh, that the United States was willing to go toe-to-toe -to, -toe to defend every inch of NATO land. I don't think we have the soundbite, but it brings up an important question. Uh, you've got Russian forces now operating awfully close to U.S. troops. The 82nd Airborne is in the far, far extreme of the spear, right, yeah. on, the, right on the Polish border and the Russians are bombing in Ukraine very close. You've been in Iraq and Afghanistan. You've served in combat. I feel like the possibilities of a miscalculation and then an escalation are just dangerously high. Well, there's no doubt about that. Deconflicting uh, airspace and land space is going to be a challenge, and we've got to, we've got to talk about that. We have to figure out what happens when you know, a, a mistake happens and a missile lands in Poland. We have to talk about what happens when an intrusion of the airspace happens. All those things have got to be worked out and what our specific response is going to be. And Leland, I, I you know, I'm a, I was a physician when I was in special operations, but before that, I was an infantry officer and I commanded a rifle company in the 82nd Airborne Division. These are great Americans and they're ready. They just have got to have solid, well thought out rules of engagement. Have, do they? Well, that's a good question, and we'll be asking the DOD about that. I'm heading back to D.C., and we'll have a conference with uh, Austin and figure that out. But it's, it's very important. One of the things that the Congress can get involved in is just use of force and, you know, what, what the Congress has to say about these deployments. I appreciate the War Powers Act. I, I believe in its basic tenets. But Congress still has some say in this, hmm. and uh, we'll be debating that. There's a, there's a conference call tonight to discuss that. Uh, more, more to follow. All right, 14,000 so or so U.S. troops already deployed, and we'll see how many additional uh, go. Where, where and how does this end if it isn't simply Vladimir Putin getting whatever he wants? Well, you know, look, let's talk about what happens um, in, in Europe, and let's talk about, about what happens in the world and the U.S. So in Europe, it's going to mean basically a, an arms race, uh, a security nightmare. You, you're going to see Europe and, and Russia uh, drawn boundaries just like the Cold War. You, you called it 2.0. Yep, that's where we are. And that's going to impact Americans. We, we're going to have less butter and more guns. Uh, we're going to have to be in this arms race with them. It's going to mean more cyber attacks to, on our nation. It's going to mean more disinformation, probably Putin's involvement in elections. You know, the, the Mueller report at least came to that conclusion. Russia was involved in trying to create disunity in America, and he did it in 2020 as well. So we're going to get more of that. Um, and of course, with this happening and the sanctions, there'll be more inflation, the price of oil. It's looking like it rose about 8% today. Uh, it could go as high as 120 bucks. And what that means, think of the farmer who's got to plow his field with diesel or, uh, you know, get that uh, produce to market. 
everything in America, it, the inflation is just going to continue up. The supply chain. I mean, this is going to impact America. It's going to impact Europe. And then you got to think about Xi Jinping uh, and yeah. the other despots of the world. Uh, 16 uh, fighter aircraft in Taiwan's airspace today. Uh, you know, I, I think the president needs to send two destroyers right now to the Taiwan Strait and just park them there. Um, but we'll see if this president does that. Yeah, no, uh, no, look, if, you, if, you're, if you're Xi Jinping or any of the other bad boys of the world, if you're one of the, if you're the Ayatollah, uh, if, you're Nicholas, if you're Nicholas Maduro, <laughs> we can yeah. go through, we both got the same list. You can go through yeah. it. They, they have no reason to have any fear of the United States. I want to get back to that point, but you were in Ukraine right before this invasion. You met with the Ukrainian yeah. government and the Ukrainian military. We have some video of the Ukrainians uh, that they have put out of their fight against the Russians over the past 24 hours. It is, it is not a fair fight. This is an NFL team taking on, at best, maybe a Division III college team uh, with, with a couple of good players, namely the weapons they've gotten from the United States, Javelin anti-tank missiles. I know that was something you were a big proponent of. And Stinger anti-aircraft guns, uh, anti-aircraft missiles, conceivably to take down the Russian helicopters that are flying. Uh, does the Ukrainian army have really the ability to hold out? We've been hearing estimates of two or three days before the Russians could be uh, outside and strangling the capital. Well, I'm a little bit surprised to tell you the truth that the Russians haven't gotten farther in 24 hours than they have. Uh, I believe the Ukrainians are definitely fighting and fighting hard. You can see videos from people in the country that they're sending out where they've shot down not only helicopters, but high-performance aircraft, fixed-wing aircraft. They're shooting them down. So this, is, this fight is, I think, going to be a surprise to Putin. And I, I am uh, very happy to see that they're holding out better than we expected. Now, it, the truth of the matter is, you, you hit the nail on the head, their capability, their supply of ammunition, all of those, uh, particularly the technological systems like Stingers and Javelins, it's just not there. They'll run out of that stuff, and uh, eventually Russia will, will win. Russia will take Ukraine. Now, what's next, though, is an insurgency, and an insurgency is very cheap. It's inexpensive to fight an insurgency, and from what I hear and from my conversations with just the average Ukrainian on the street, they're ready to fight that fight. Yeah, well, we've heard at least that there were like 10 or 12,000 rifles just now handed out inside the Capitol for, for them to fight. Um, the one thing that's been pretty stellar in this whole thing is American intel. You think about the debacle in Afghanistan, you think about WMD, you think about missing Saddam going into Kuwait, you think about missing the Russians going into Afghanistan. And yet, on this issue of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it was spot on to a T in a way that was pretty stunning. That's got to be good for America and at least maybe a little bit bracing for Vladimir Putin? Well, I would think so. I don't want to comment too much on, you know, the quality of our intel because I have to be very careful about that. You know, I would never want to say anything that would compromise a source. But I, I agree with your statement that our intel services have done a much better job here than they ever did with the Taliban. Yeah, well, with the Taliban or, or, or in the past. Um, if we're going to get into the point that you made earlier about the pain that the Russians, that the Ukrainians are extracting from the Russians and whether that's going to change Vladimir Putin's calculus uh, in, terms of, in terms of his own internal politics. But if Vladimir Putin succeeds on the world stage. Jungle rules are back. He yeah. has said already that he wants to rebuild the Soviet Union. Adolf Hitler said he wanted to, to control Europe, rebuild Germany, if you will, in this greater ethnic Germany. Is there any reason for him to not take Poland or one of the Baltic states or start picking more fights with NATO and all of a sudden every family member who's got a, a family member, every family's got a loved one in uniform realizes we're, we're back at it? Absolutely. What we're doing, if we don't stop him, and it looks like we're not going to stop him, is we just validated his modus operandi. And that is, and you experienced it when you were in the region. Uh, you send in infiltrators. They, you know, pretend to live there. They create riots and disinformation. They, uh, you, you know, basically, I, I don't want to say... Uh, use uh, 
propaganda like a well they do they use propaganda as a weapon they they alter the television shows kind of what china wants to do in america um but and they basically turn the people in that area then they cry foul and he comes rushing in to save the day that's going to happen in the republic of georgia it's going to happen in the baltics and it's going to happen in poland and it, it's a modus operandi that we just validated by allowing it to happen with this piecemeal approach with with this sanctions. I mean, no. we should have been hammering them with the big stick from day one. And and I don't mean day one as yesterday. I mean with surrounding Ukraine. Yeah, we only got another minute or two, but I'm fascinated by the the president admitting outright that no one ever thought that sanctions were going to deter Vladimir Putin. They've been saying exactly the opposite for months. That's exactly right. Exactly the opposite for months. And it just was stunning that nobody in the speechwriting department realized that they were going to get caught uh, in this, but or in the talking in the talking voice department. But sometimes people make an honest an honest statement, even if it's after the fact. This would be the the bigger question, though. We were promised these punishing, overwhelming sanctions, and yet still they haven't come. Not a single sanction against Vladimir Putin personally. No delisting of the banks. Uh, if invading Ukraine, bombing it saying you're going to decapitate it and threatening the, the world with nuclear war doesn't get you sanctioned personally, what does? That's a real good question for the president, Leland. <laughs> I mean, to, to leave Putin untouched, unscathed, yeah. is unconscionable. It makes no sense to anyone. Even an NBC reporter said you know, basically that today in, in the news conference. This is absurd. We should have sanctions on him. The SWIFT bank stuff should be done. We should crush their energy sector and we should crush their currency. And the fact that we're not doing it is just, I mean, I can't explain it. No, it's perplexing, really, um, that the, the decisions continue down the very same path and that no one seems to learn that Vladimir Putin is not deterred by whatever's happening. Congressman, exactly. uh, we appreciate your time. We know we'll see you back. Uh, at 11 o'clock Eastern for more on this. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact driven, unbiased coverage.